Broadcasting from Asheville, North Carolina, USA, it's WPVM's 2020 City Council Candidate Forum. Tonight's moderator is Matt Henson, and there are five candidates in tonight's forum. In alphabetic order, the candidates are Sandra Kilgore, Rich Lee, Kim Roney, Sage Turner, and Keith Young. Questions for the candidates have been selected based upon current issues that are facing our community. WPVM is honored to bring this forum to the community. As a non-commercial station, our mission is to inform and entertain our listeners. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us here over at 103.7 WPVM. Uh, we are live on the radio tonight. Uh, my name is Matt Henson, and I will be your moderator for this very special um, virtual Asheville City Council debate. Um, so that everybody knows kind of what's going on, we're going to start with uh, two-minute opening statements from all the uh, council elects. And then we will move into a five question um, process where the, each council member getting um, two minutes to answer each of the five questions presented. Um, once that's done, we will uh, go through closing statements from um, all the members and then there'll be a short um, outro video. So I appreciate everyone joining us tonight via the radio, YouTube um, or Facebook Live. Um, so what we'll do is we'll get ki things kick started with uh, opening statements. We're going to start with uh, Mr. Young and uh, we will give you the floor to uh, begin. Right. I know folks are going to hear a lot tonight, so I won't take probably all of the two minutes, but a little bit of it. Um, I want to say thank you for having this uh, this event, this forum tonight. And I appreciate everyone who uh, put this on and those of you who are out there watching. Uh, I've been on city council uh, since 2015. And since I've been on council, I've had the privilege and the honor to work for you, the citizens of the city of Asheville, in a capacity where I believe we've done a lot of great work. It's um, the times that we're in right now are very challenging, but from 2015 to now, we've accomplished a lot in this city and we have a lot more to do. Uh, we've built the most affordable house. We've helped build the most affordable housing here in the city in quite some time. Uh, we've paved more roads and streets and built more sidewalks than any other time in our city's history. Uh, we've refurbished and, and revamped more parks than any other time in our city's history. We've had more infrastructure spending than any other time in our city's history. And we've attacked real critical social issues such as uh, equity and inclusion and systemic racism in our city. I wanna be able to continue to work for you. I wanna be able to lean into some of these issues and be able to give it the care and the empathy that it deserves uh, to be uh, a voice for not just people that look like me, but for folks who don't look like me. I represent everybody in this city and I wanna be able to do that uh, moving forward as we face some of our city's most critical issues and how we develop and how we grow uh, as a community together. And that is my goal, to make sure that everyone is at the table, that we are listening to everyone and that we are growing the community in a way where everyone can succeed and thrive together. Shall I go next? My name is Kim Roney. I'm a service industry worker, piano teacher, community radio producer, uh, pedestrian, friend, and a neighbor, and I'm running for city council. Um, I know from a personal level that so many people in Asheville are struggling to make ends meet on stagnant wages and fixed incomes. As the cost of living rises and while the tourism industry strains our natural resources and our infrastructure, we need a just transition through the COVID-19 pandemic through climate change, systemic racism, and economic instability. But the work we need to do, we can't do alone. So I need you. We don't yet have enough people on council that are gonna center the voices of the people and healing the planet. Um, so I need you to send me to be faithful to the work. I've been attending Asheville City Council meetings for almost six years, serving on boards and commissions, reporting back through community radio, through JM Pro, through AVL Community Report Back. But I need you to send me to make these decisions and to be faithful to the work. I'm committed. Please vote for me for Asheville City Council. And thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Roney. Uh, next up will be uh, Sage Turner. I think you're muted, Sage. Yeah, your microphone's off. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for hosting us tonight. I hope the sound is coming through okay. And I appreciate you all pivoting in this virtual way. So my name is Sage Turner and I am running for city council because I believe we can take better care of each other and better care of our community and how we grow and how we all thrive. 
a little background about myself before we get into the issue. I lived in Asheville for 20 years and raised my family here. I am a recently empty nester. My son, my youngest, was a graduate of the class of 2020 in the middle of the start of the pandemic. Uh, my background is in finance and city planning. So I have a master's degree in city planning. And I currently am employed by the French Broad Food Co-op as their finance and project manager. And we have just kicked off our expansion and I'll be managing that construction for several years. I have about 20 years of governance experience on various boards and commissions, whether they be nonprofit or business or government. I uh, currently serve for the Asheville Downtown Association, which is a organization of businesses in downtown. I also serve on MANA Food Bank's board, which serves 16 counties, uh, striving to end hunger in Western North Carolina. And both of those I've served or still serving as their treasurer. Uh, for the city, I chair the city's affordable housing committee and the downtown commission. And I have been on both of those boards for about five years. So everything, every major project or hotel moratorium or housing development or affordable housing policy has somehow been um, at the tables that I'm also at. We have great community members working on these issues and moving them forward. And I'm thrilled to be part of that work. Um, I so clearly care about affordable housing. The other platforms are uh, education and environmental justice and growing smart and strategically for the upcoming growth that we know we'll be facing in the next 20 years. And I am concerned about our fiscal sustainability and environmental sustainability and the combination of those two and the pivot that we need to make to really get out of the direction that we as a community have voiced. And thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Uh, next up we have Mr. Lee. I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you, WPBM for putting on this event. Um, my name is Rich Lee. I'm um, a 23 year Western North Carolina resident, Nashville resident. Um, I am a return Peace Corps volunteer and my background is in um, volunteering, teaching, and community development, although right now I um, work as a financial advisor for the firm Edward Jones. I'm running for city council because I, I think the explosive growth of our region is outpacing the city's ability to, to plan proactively and to, to manage it. And so we're seeing growth that is benefiting a few industries or a few people, but not, um, but also leaving many people behind. It's producing an unequitable results. As somebody um, with a financial background, I'm concerned about the city's ability to keep planning for affordable housing and, um, and um, new greenways, new sidewalks, new parks and transportation um, amenities. And so I wanna bring that financial background and a background of a longtime resident who sees the community changing and cares. I'm a parent of four um, elementary age kids who are in Asheville City Schools. So I'm also concerned about the situation in the Asheville City Schools and in our city's role in directing that. Um, I'll just add, since I want us to be able to get to the questions uh, from the forum, that I have served as the chair of the city's multimodal transportation commission, co-chair of the city's Greenway Committee, um, treasurer of the Buncombe County Democratic Party, Green Opportunities, and a number of other local organizations. Thank you, and I think I hope I'll have your vote before November third. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, and finally, we have Ms. Kilgore. I will give you the floor. Hi, everyone, and thank you so very much for putting this forum on. Uh, my name is Sandra Kilgore, and I'm actually a native of Asheville. However, I've only been here back home uh, since 2012. Uh, I went to Asheville High School, uh, UNCA, um, and I left here in 1976 to go fly for the airlines. But anyway, what I wanted to say is this. Um, on my return home in 2012, I, it was like Asheville had changed so much. It wasn't the place I remember leaving. And because of that reason, I stepped out and I started doing things, working in the community, helping people with home uh, foreclosure prevention and anything I could do to help because people needed help and there was nowhere for them to get it. I started working with the Arthur Eddington Center. We were able to get, secure the Arthur Eddington Center for the neighborhood. Um, and it's been an epic uh, educational center, uh, center for the um, South Side area. And the reason I ran for city council is because 
the Astros not the place I remember growing up. I remember when people worked together and take care of each other. I remember when people took care of the children in the community, just like they were their own. And now all of a sudden it seems so divided. And when I say divided, I'm not talking about just the racial divide. I'm talking about the divide among the community. And that was something that I wanted to base my campaign on. I wanted to base my campaign on uniting the whole community and working together because we're stronger together. That was the reason why I'm running. And I tell people that right now I do have my own real estate company that I run, but let me give you a little background from where I came from. I was born and raised in a home 700 square feet with six kids and, and, and two parents. I remember getting food baskets left on my uh, doorstep. I remember my father telling the children, eat today and don't worry about tomorrow. This is how I grew up. And what I want to let people know is working hard. With the system, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but working hard and working together, then we can all thrive because I'm an example. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, that's the opening statements. We're going to now transition um, into the questions that we're going to be presenting tonight. Um, so we will put the first one up and then we will uh, we will get rolling. So let's have that first question. All right. <clears throat> Kimberly Archie, the city, excuse me, Kimberly Archie, the city's first equity and inclusion manager, resigned in August, citing a false appearance of support that was never backed by action by the department heads. According to the AVL watchdog interview with Ms. Archie, she said those departments included transportation, water, and public works, and described the public works staff as, uh, paraphrased, intolerant. What do you think elected officials should do to encourage, enforce, and educate tolerance in the city's workplaces? Um, first person we have to answer this question will be Mrs. Turner, and I will hand the floor over to you. I can't hear Sage. Is it just me? Yeah, Ms. Turner, your microphone's yeah. muted. It shouldn't be. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. If you want to start over, that's fine. We can hear um, you. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'll start over. So um, I think what's happened is unfortunate. I recently read the article in the ABL Watchdog. I'm disappointed to learn of Ms. Archie's departure. Having worked with her on a couple initiatives, I thought she was an incredible asset to the city. So I think as an elected official, you know, we have uh, oversight of three positions, one of which is the city manager. So we have to hold the city manager accountable to what's happened in this situation and learn more about this disconnect. It sounded like Ms. Archie had attempting to discuss issues with the city manager, was uh, experiencing ongoing problems with a couple of departments and they were never, her concerns were never ratified or heard. And it's not okay. Uh, so as elected officials, we have to hold our employee, Ms. De accountable for that. I also think we've made some good initiatives in the last three years and we need to remind ourselves that a culture shift at the level that we need is expansive and it's going to last more than one person and more than one role and more than one error. And I think, you know, it's unfortunate and I hope that we are able to restaff this position and look at alternative ways where the Department of Equity may be more streamlined inside departments instead of an outside body that is weighing in uh, on the various topics. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening with the time. I'm getting a flash that the time is up, but I, I'm not sure if the meeting happened. Yeah, we'll need to reset that, but you can continue. Okay. Um, so, you know, some of those, some of the things that we could do or look at how this department has, has um, been rolled throughout various issues. One of the issues that comes to mind is the hotel moratorium as the chair of the downtown commission, I was heavily involved in this. And when we reviewed the overlay district, which is when we put uh, different maps out and said this is where hotels may or may not be allowed, I was very curious to hear from the Department of Equity and Inclusion how they felt about these new zones on the map. In the history of Asheville and other cities, we have, we have, take, we have actually redlined and zoned certain areas that had economical impacts on the community. And it seemed like a pivotal thing. So I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about issues of how the department itself can be uh, more universal in its approach, you know, more responsive to particular issues as they come up. In that particular case, I would have liked to have seen a report from that department on their perception of how this impact from the new zoning 
impacted the rest of the neighborhoods and communities around them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next up, we'll have Mrs. Rooney. I'll give you the floor. Thank you for asking this question. Um, I'm really sad and embarrassed that as taxpayers, as a community, that we've allowed um, systems of oppression and, and inequity to persist in City Hall. Um, because this situation isn't just about this time, it's about all of us together as a community. Now, when we get down to the specifics of the Equity and Inclusion Office, I heard the word tolerance used, and tolerance is certainly not enough. We need equity and inclusion all of the time. We need an equity lens on our budget planning and policies. And unfortunately, we have not had enough people on city council to hold our top level staff accountable to that equity happening. And we've seen this as an outcome. So what we need to be doing is we need enough people on city council who are gonna take the responsibility to do very extensive peer reviews with outcomes um, and not just like peer reviews, but of the staff. Um, doing staff reviews is not fun. I've done them before at a corporate level, but it is an opportunity to high five and celebrate the work that's being done well. And then if something isn't getting done, then we have a responsibility to ask, did I not give you the resources or the authority to get the work done? Or is it simply just not gonna happen? Because it's possible that you're not the right person for the job. And we all have a role to play in this community. But it's my opinion, and I've seen it in City Hall watching for years in the audience and participating on boards and commission, that the work isn't getting done efficiently. And we don't yet have enough transparency and we don't yet have enough accountability. But if we're really gonna be better, if we're really going to center equity, then we have to be honest and tell the truth. And I think what we're seeing with Ms. Archie leaving is that um, it was too much for any one person. So we need more people to come to the table, to ask our city council, to hold our top level staff accountable, to do an equity audit of our city planning budget policies. I think participatory budgeting can be part of that, um, but we definitely need to deep dive into the budget and make sure that our dollars are backing up our community values. It's not happening yet, but I'm hopeful that if the people show up and demand healing and equity, then um, it'll be an inside out strategy and we can do better together. Thank you so much. Uh, next, Ms. Kilgore, you have the floor. Yes, yes, yes. I was very sad too to see Kimberly Archie leave. However, I do realize that it's a, it was a new position that was in place uh, in 2017. And I realized just like with anything else, it takes time. I think we need to work harder on not um, and, and working together to put things together to, to um, work on the solutions. And, and the problem I see is maybe she was not getting that support uh, or make, no, it's obvious she was not getting that support. But I think that what we could have done better is to make more or less uh, with the job description that she had and different things and, and let other departments realize the importance of her position and then putting more pressure on them to work with her, that should have been done. Uh, however, um, but it was not. And those are things we need to work on for uh, making people more accountable. We need to have more oversight uh, and that is what the council is for. However, I, like I said, I do realize this is a new position and uh, with new things, it usually takes time for them to work through the issues. And this just sort of magnifying gla uh, glass on uh, pretty much of issues that actually need to be addressed uh, more thoroughly. So, um, and, and that being said, I don't think it's anyone that's to blame for it happening. I think it was just something that happened that has uh, put magnifying glass on it and we need to actually work hard to get the issue resolved for the community. All right, thank you, Mrs. Kilgore. Uh, next up we have Mr. Lee, I will give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, so I haven't had a chance to talk to um, Kimberly or the equity inclusion staff um, since this change happened. And um, I hope to be able to soon and get more perspective than um, what was in the Asheville Ar um, Watchdog article. Um, my experience with the equity and inclusion department um, has been um, positive aspects and negative aspects, but I think thinking about them and um, thinking about specifically about um, projects that um, that Kim and I uh, worked on in the trans with, along with the transportation department, 
then we had um, what what I experienced was the equity and inclusion input coming late in a process that tended to roll up investments and roll up um, a kind of emotional investment and momentum. And if anything, what I'd like to see as a council member is the equity and inclusion um, participation and lens very early in planning processes so we don't get far into something and, um, and, and start to get feedback from equity and inclusion that, ch that um, changes our course. Um, in my experience with the transportation department, I have seen transportation staffers be responsive to the um, input, to input from the equity and inclusion department and really take to heart the, the mission and the, the impact of equity and inclusion um, and the way it should be centered in every activity of the city. And I've seen um, areas where there and projects where there was more friction. And so um, I, I, I'm eager to find out more of what's happening, um, what needs to happen there and ways to make it function better as a role of the city, whether it's staffers inside departments that are um, participating in processes from the start or a beefed up outside um, departments like we have now. Thank you, Rich. Um, and Mr. Young, you're up to the floor. Thank you. Um, first off, let me say, since day one on the job, when I was sworn in in December of 2015, uh, I've been committed to equity and inclusion and this city moving forward and growing together. No less than two weeks after being sworn in, um, I had worked with a community uh, group who were, we were looking to ban the box. And that is exactly what I did the next following weeks so after being sworn in was reached out to council members and started having those conversations about equity and what this meant and went on into our, uh, our January um, retreat and talked about equity. And that came out of that was our 2036 vision. You asked in the question, um, what, what should we do to encourage and enforce and educate uh, in the workforce? I would say, you know, for the first part, it's, it's, it's sad that what happened with our equity department. Um, so immediately, you know, there's a couple of things that I've been asking for. And I asked uh, on September the 22nd that we do the following, which is one, I think we need to fill that role of equity and inclusion uh, immediately and get someone in place in that department. That department that includes the equity director is uh, about four individuals. Two, I wanted the, uh, we asked the city manager to reassess the active roles of equity uh, and city government to improve the culture of equity and inclusion in conjunction with her office. Uh, three, uh, on a council level, I asked for our governance committee to look at the structure in de of the Department of Equity and Inclusion and receive a thorough update on all the work that's currently being done, including our equity action plan that's already in place. Um, and four, I've also asked for the city attorney's office to explore other ways of, 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 of weaving equity into uh, our culture within the city, even if that includes uh, another position that answers to council or looking at what can be done with the current structure. And then lastly, uh, I've asked that council take part um, in its review of the city manager when that comes up to, uh, to, to talk and, 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 and see how we can better synergize our relationships and expectations on communication on what is expected on the front of her office or and, and have a review ready for us uh, for whoever is on council and follow those steps to begin with to continue to strengthen our equity department and make sure that equity is in every facet of what we do as a city government, um, that it is included in everything that we do, and that that lens is being applied to everything that we do. So if we, we can't go out into the community and expect the community and private organizations to implement equity, equity if we don't do it correctly in our city. And it's a tough job. It's going to be hard. Uh, some things that we've been working on for quite some time since 2015. And I don't expect these things to be solved overnight, but I do expect us to lean into all of these conversations and, and tough issues and try to figure this thing out together. All right, thank you, sir. And we will now move to question number two, uh, which are which is a pretty simple question. Um, what are your plans for dealing with the long-term repercussions to Asheville's economy due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic? We will start with uh, Kim and I will give you the floor. Thank you so much. Um, we've heard a lot of conversations about what a just transition looks like. 
Um, I think one of the things that we talk about a lot in community is that the city budget is too small and we're limited from doing the things that we need to do. But I think we are gonna have to get real about the fact that we have a lot of resources in this community and we're duplicating services and we're not demanding transparency around the use of all of our funds. So I think one of the good things that we can do that would be a cause for celebration in our community is to do some resource mapping. So we not only have the city and the county budget as taxpayers, but we also have the TEA budget. And we're not getting enough of our hotel occupancy dollars to address systemic change, our infrastructure, the impact of tourism in our community, the impact of low wage jobs and resource extraction. We also have the Dogwood Health Trust. And so if we're looking at all of our resources in our community, then we could be getting a lot done. Um, I realize for like everyday working class folks like myself, poor folks, compassionate folks, it seems daunting to think about like, all the things you have to do in a day just to survive, make ends meet, um, meet the needs of your family and your neighbors, doing mutual aid, to think about trying to hold on to the tasks and responsibility of all these different resource pools. Um, that's why we send representatives to elected office to hold these groups accountable. Um, but it's not anything that any one person can do by themselves. So we are going to have to make sure we maintain core city services like we've done before during the recession, we're gonna to have to make sure that housing and access to transit um, and that people's daily basic needs are met. Um, but we can do this together. We just need to coordinate our efforts and we need to demand transparency around our budget planning and policies. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we will hand it off to Keith now, the floor is yours. Sure, um, so the question is on the screen here, I can see what's, what, what are the plans for, for dealing with long-term repercussions uh, to Asheville's economy due to the pandemic. I think right now, um, some of the projections that we're getting as a city, um, you know, there was a lot of thought that it would adversely affect our budget. Um, and so right now we are receiving a, a, a great deal of funds from the federal government to <clears throat> supplement, excuse me, to supplement some of the things, some of the spending that we've had to do uh, during the pandemic so, thus far. So we're covered on that end. And then uh, our fund balance is looking to project at a normal pace of about between 16 and 18, excuse me, 17 to 18%, I believe, which is a pretty healthy fund balance to have. So what happens now uh, moving forward? How do we deal with the long-term repercussions? I think immediately, you know, you have to look at small business here. As much, uh, There was a question in another forum that we had uh, about a week ago that, that I talked about this. And we have to strengthen up our small businesses to begin with. It takes a lot of work to open a new business. And you've got to arrange financing. You've got to find locations, suppliers, hire workers. And basically, you know, during this pandemic, pandemic, if a business declares bankruptcy and shuts down during the pandemic, that whole process has to start again. And it's going to take time. It's going to take money. And that's going to produce a slower recovery. So in addition uh, to, you know, once our economy really opens back up, Businesses are probably going to be fearful that, you know, something, a resurgence of Corona or something else may happen to slow it down. And those businesses might be less likely to invest in equipment, research and development, and, and that affects our long term growth. And so also, aside from the businesses, we have to talk, take care of our, our long human capital, which is the workers for these businesses and, and try to diversify you know, what comes in as new businesses. But for the workers who lost their jobs, the relationship between workers and businesses is very valuable. So we've got employers and workers who would typically spend a lot of time, um, you know, we've got to help them find a good match. Um, workers have to acquire firm specific skills and knowledge, and we've got to figure out how to match those workers that are out of the job market to businesses that are opening back up. And once those firms open back up, can we place these individuals and high paying jobs. And that's not a role that we do as a city, but it's something that we can help facilitate through our work with the chamber, uh, through other organizations around our community. We we, we just uh, partnered with the chamber on an inclusive hiring partner uh, program that connects people and families facing significant employment barriers uh, with better career opportunities and high demand industry. So that's one way that we can help with the long term uh, uh, detriment of our economy right now. But I think and this is a big thing. I think we're going to be on a better track than we believe we will moving forward based on the projections we're getting from our staff. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, next, we have Rich, and I will give you the floor. 
Yeah, thank you for this. Um, so I, I think the biggest part of dealing with the long-term repercussions is to deal with the short-term repercussions and triage the damage that's being done right now. Because Asheville is on the verge of losing potentially thousands of families that live here um, when the eviction ban dispire, expires at the end of the year. Um, Asheville is losing irreplaceable small businesses and artists, um, independent um, uh, craftspeople and the, and the institutions and um, businesses that that um, that create the culture that is such a big part of the value of what we have here. And so, one of the things we've seen just on the news um, prior to this interview starting is that federal help is not and stimulus is not likely to come until after the election. State stimulus and support may not come until it is too late to save many um, independent restaurants and stores and businesses that are teetering on the edge here in our community. So we have to preserve those because if we lose them, there is, there is no getting them back the same way that they have. It'll be more openings for, for chain businesses, for, for national businesses, and for a, you know, a generally older and wider population to, um, to, to fill back into the area, especially as people flee climate change in other areas of the country. So we, the city and county need to be the leader of this and they need to release those um, balance funds to the maximum safe extent possible. And then once we are through that, we need to look on expanding our portfolio of businesses away from tourism and filling areas like technology, healthcare, small manufacturing, and um, and, and the, the kinds of businesses that have already proved to be recession resilient here and that can employ our workforce that we have here with sustaining career track jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, Sage, you now have the floor. Your microphone's off. Uh, so sorry, new platform. Um, thank you for asking this question. Uh, to me, this is an all hands on deck time. Um, and we don't have the we don't have the time to wait to take action. So for me personally, as soon as COVID hit, I have great relationships with lots of small businesses in downtown. I immediately got to work um, with an online resource and pairing people with the grants, helping people apply for PPP, setting them up with the idol, um, helping raise money for the one from fund, and just doing everything I could day and night to help businesses. And I think. Um, and it was somewhat successful, you know, helping people under, understand and navigate the unemployment systems online. All of these things we had to do right away. Um, but we're going to need greater solutions. I heard someone mention the risk of all this lost space and the incoming people, and that is what we're at. We are seeing restaurants fail. We are seeing commercial and, real, and retail shops close, and the risk of other people coming in buying up those spaces is very high right now. Um, we need a slow process, though. We do not need to rush and reopen like we're seeing throughout the nation, this push to just pretend COVID has gone away. We still need to protect our community. Our, our rates of uh, COVID are actually spiking again. Um, there has been some good news and some things I've advocated for. So uh, we had an HB 1200, a North Carolina house bill that recently died, but was um, gaining some momentum that would have brought more money to the community. And when the CARES Act did drop some money into Asheville, we first got $615,000. We dedicated 200000 of it to preventing houselessness via partnership with PISGA or Homeward Bound and another 200000 to help with rental assistance via a partnership with PISGA Legal. We have recently had another $900,000 come in from the CARES Act. It is currently going under review for how to divvy that up. And I think we need it for helping people manage their houses and in their businesses and offsetting mortgages if needed because of the rental. They allow the rent to go unpaid. Um, I do think there are some interesting things about the tourism tax that need to be noticed. You know, uh, if you've been paying attention, we have done five days of advertising since the 15th, and yet occupancy is up in the 70 percentile for weekends and in the high 50s, low 60s for the weekdays. And this tells me that we don't need to spend $19 million advertising Asheville anymore. And what they did, what the uh, CVP did with that $5 million in investing in local businesses to help them sustain through COVID is a great thing. Um, Thank you. Sorry. All right. Thank you, Sage. Um, Sandra, you have the floor. Yes. 
Okay, the first plan uh, the city needs to put in place is to ensure that we can put measures in place to control the virus. Because basically, if the virus is not uh, the economy and what's happening with the people in the community, the reason why is the virus. The virus is the root. And until we get that under control, then our economy will suffer. So basically, I think the first thing they need to do is ensure that we have programs in place to mitigate any, I mean, and destroy the growth of the coronavirus. Because once those uh, measures are put in place that lowers the coronavirus threat, then people will feel comfortable, will feel people will go out to restaurants and they will support the businesses. Uh, and, and, and pretty much the people will come out and pretty much when people come out, then the economy will basically grow. As far as uh, the people that are gonna be suffering as far as rents and things like that, so different programs, I know that stages involved with Thrive, and these programs are gonna be very important and we need to make sure that they um, can actually put out there to help community stay afloat. Small businesses are suffering and will be suffering uh, greatly. So I think they're the ones that actually need a lot of support so I think that we need to actually set up strategic plans for going out and uh, speaking and talking to the people in the small business arena and sort of figuring out what their needs are and what we can do to make them sustainable. Because with their growth, then the economy will grow. And pretty much, uh, and I think we could pretty much take care of ourselves. As far as the um, city council and the budget, of course, all the central services and things like that should be covered first. But any additional money, rather than be put in frivolous, or not frivolous, uh, things that we don't need right now, we need to make sure that that money is going to uh, grow in our economy. Okay, thank you everyone for that. We'll move on to question number three. Um, the reparations initiative in Asheville recently made national headlines. What does the decision by city council mean to you, and how would you oversee this reparations initiative? Uh, we'll start with Sandra, and I will give you the floor. Oh, I was very happy to see, and I was very proud of City Council for the initiative to vote uh, the need for reparations uh, as part of our agenda. Reparations, and, and the thing is with reparations, people look at it in two different ways. Um, I look at it as a way for the city to actually acknowledge that there is a need um, to uh, make right some of the things that's been happening to many people in the community uh, as of color. And by acknowledging that, then what has happened, that is the first step. So I'm really happy with that. And now it takes time for us now to actually develop plans in order to actually get the best impact from it. And I think uh, what has happened, I've noticed in the city, because of this reparation of um, uprise or whatever, I've noticed that plenty of large companies and people want to know what can they do to help. I'm a, a broker with the real estate uh, board of realtors. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of the political action committee for the board of realtors. And the one thing they came to me and said, Sandra, how can we help? And, and that's what it's going to take a lot of people helping. So I think in line of what's happening here with it, um, I basically think that it was a very good movement, and I think that um, I will make sure that uh, I do all I can to get as many companies involved as possible to make sure that it uh, helps the community. All right, thank you, Sandra. Next we have Keith, and I will give you the floor. Thank you. Um, as many of you probably already know, if, unless you've been under a rock, I, I was the council member who introduced our reparations resolution. And, um, you know, there's, I've said this time and time again, there's this, this, this concept in America that's called the American dream that we basically all have the same opportunity to generate the kind of wealth that establishes uh, true meaning to the words life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And even though you know, through those words, Black Americans haven't haven't had that opportunity. Um, we have a story past in this country and a history that continues to haunt us basically to this day through policies and procedures that hinder 
our unabated opportunity that everyone wants. So based on that history and those current systemics enters reparations, as we talked about earlier tonight, equity and inclusion. Um, what does it mean to me? It, it, you know, it means all of those things, acknowledging our past and also acknowledging the fact that systemic racism and oppression has definitely been built into the systems that we all live and work in. Um, how do we further reparations? How do we oversee the reparations initiative? I think that's laid out in the reparations resolution with the uh, inclusion of other municipalities uh, around our county to come to the table and join us along with members of the community to tell us how they want to be made whole to reparations. From a council standpoint and a leader, on the, and a leader in this initiative, I would say that council needs to establish some funding for reparations, funding that would allow uh, individuals to uh, uh, get grants for generational wealth, to, to buy, uh, buy homes, land, start businesses, those sorts of things. I think we've 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 got a long way to go, but I think there's some ways that we can do that. We can start a blended component unit where, as Sandra mentioned, she's had people that want to donate. We can do that where individuals and private organizations can donate to it, as well as the city offering funds up for a reparations initiative to figure out how can we continue to lean into this as we do many other things and and, and acknowledge uh, that this is not going to be fixed overnight. But the city of Asheville is in a good footing, um, more so than other places, to complete this task um, and get it started moving forward. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have Re Rich, and I will give you the floor. Thank you. Um, so um, in 1963, at the... Um, during, during the civil rights movement, basically the, the end of official Jim Crow, the average white American had something like seven times more net worth, more, more household wealth than the average black American. And if you, you've ever owned a stock or home or property, then you know that over time, that you know, time plus wealth is more wealth. And so what we've seen in America is we've seen a a gap open up between black wealth and white wealth due to the policies of Jim Crow and the legacy of slavery and also um, due to things that have been um, policies that have continued to be in place since then. But what the uh, what I think is really clever about um, reparations and the reparations re resolution is it recognizes that the city or the state government or the federal government can't just declare we're going to be equitable from here on out and that gap shrink on its own. There has to be some way to return wealth that, um, that was misappropriated or taken or, di or disinvested from black communities. And I think the reparations resolution lays out a good roadmap for how to make that happen. It points specifically to city government projects like the East End Valley Street project that removed um, land from black ownership that, um, that basically destroyed black business districts and says that's a way that a direct city action took wealth away from black families of Asheville. It points to um, the economic and cultural impacts of um, disparate policing, which we know we have here in Asheville, and how that can remove people from the job pool or from future earnings and wealth. Um, it points to the problems in their school system with the racial and um, academic opportunity gap or achievement gap. And so it lays out ways to say these are ways that wealth has been removed from black people in Asheville by direct policies of the city. And here's how we can start. And then we can start to bring in these regional players and state and federal for action on an increasing circle of, um, of items. All right. Thank you, Rich. Next, we have Sage. I will give you the floor. Thank you. And I want to make sure we thank uh, the Racial Justice Coalition and Rob for their work in helping draft these uh, reparations resolution. Um, you know, we the history is to move forward. We have to under, understand the history. And we have de-equitized Black Asheville, not just Asheville, but many cities have through what happened with redlining in the 30s and again with urban renewal in the 50s and 60s. And it continues to perpetuate currently with the criminalization of Black men and the equity gap between Black and white children in Asheville. It is still continuing. So I would be honored and thrilled and humbled and very to work on reparations initiatives. And to me, I think, you know, there's going to be some kind of community process and a reparations committee. And I look forward to hearing more from that committee and the community at large about what reparations are for them. I think for me and my uh, 
where I come from in life, I know that home ownership as a single full-time parent has meant all the difference to me and starting my family and getting my son into college and starting generational wealth. So I think home ownership is key. And it's also one of the things we decimated through urban renewal. Uh, I think we have to talk about equity in policing and public safety. We have to talk about equity in our education system, both in the gap that we're seeing between our black and white children, but also the fact that North Carolina, we are highest in North Carolina for the uh, school to prison pipeline, which is absurd and needs to be said and recognized and fixed. Um, there's also entrepreneurship. We uh, decimated black business district, and that needs to come back. We're not, despite saying it as a goal and putting it on paper, we have not taken the initiative to make sure we are funding black owned business or funding black contractors. Um, I'd also like to see our youth recruited. Um, you know, we have, after we have a significant high school population that we could be recruiting from to directly tie into AB Tech's uh, solar installation program, which is directly tied to our initiatives to become more solar and renewable energy sources. And we need to do things like strategically draw those lines together and get our kids and our youth and our black members of community uh, fixed and working on the um, initiative on the environment. So I would be thrilled to work on reparations, and I look forward to hearing more from the community about what that looks like to them. All right. Thank you, Sage. And Kim, you have the floor. I'm really humbled to speak on this matter. And as a white person, I just want to say thank you to intergenerational Black leadership like the Racial Justice Coalition, Black AVL Demands, and our youth who are making uh, a demand for change and for us to get in right relationship with each other. I appreciate the resolution, um, which calls on us to tell the truth. When redlining destroyed the black business owners and economic engine and neighborhoods, neighborhoods weren't just housing, right? So we have like grocery stores and we have um, faith community and we have community centers and schools um, we took all that away. So I appreciate the acknowledgement, but we don't yet have reparations in Asheville. So while we work as a nation on the um, House Resolution 40 for reparations as a whole, there are some specific things that Asheville City can do. One of the things that we're going to need to do as elected officials, but also as community, is to demand that the city manager be held accountable to meaningful action. We do need public engagement. We do need people to show up. We do need people to keep calling and writing emails, but we need outcomes to change. Um, that includes land use, because we know that zoning was meant to exclude people, not to include people. We need to update the Unified Development Ordinance with an equity lens. We need to address the opportunity gap in our schools, and that means working with people who are already doing the work through mentorship programs um, and through training programs and reentry. It means making sure that people feel welcome and included, and that means reimagining public safety. Um, but once again, if we're gonna do the land use and we're going to heal our community and we're gonna get in right relationship with each other, it means doing more than just writing it down on a paper. It means more than just talking about it. We actually have to follow through and getting this done together. And I'm thankful for our leaders that are pushing us and for our youth who are in the streets and on the phone and writing emails, I think this is only gonna be possible if we all join together at the table um, and see through meaningful action for outcomes that for healing and would be a cause for celebration. All right, thank you everyone for your answers. Um, we'll move on to question number four. Um, how do you think the recent actions of law enforcement during the protests, especially those that made national headlines reflects on the city council? Uh, I will start with you, Rich, and I'll give you the floor. Oh, well, um... So, I, um, so I was I was uh, fortunate enough to attend um, some of the the protests before the actions that we're talking about, and I didn't experience them directly, but seeing them from home on the live feeds and um, hearing about them in the news afterwards, and hearing the the reported actions from my friends and neighbors and family members that were there, um, is is just horrifying. And uh, there's there's really there's no other word for it but a an overreaction that um, that is that that breaks our community and that breaks trust in government institutions and it shows I think going forward that there is real resistance to change inside institutions of city governments um, like we were talking about with an earlier question. So um, 
as far as city council's actions go there, um, I can, you know, my personal feeling is that, um, that moves um, such as the curfew and calling in the National Guard turned out to be escalations um, in the early days of the, um, the rallies and protests downtown. Um, moves such as the firing of um, the tear gas on the Jeff Bowen Bridge, where there were, were children and peaceful protesters involved, um, um, weren't happening. And the city manager needs to account for that as the um, as the manager of city staff and city council needs to account for that as the manager of the city manager. That's all I got. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Kim, you have the floor. Yeah. Um, as a person who I'm just I'm really broken hearted about this, y'all. Like we went and got tear gas in advance to use against our neighbors. And that is unacceptable anytime, but especially during a pandemic that affects that affects the lungs. But it's not just the tear gas. Um, when we brought in agents or excuse me, officers from Hendersonville and the National Guard, we brought in people that have 287G agreements with ICE and who work with immigration enforcement. So we can have a lot of a conversation in our town about how we can't be a sanctuary city but we brought people who work with immigration enforcement into our city. That is a problem. That's a problem that it belongs to all of us. It's not just our city council, but it is on us to hold our city council responsible to instruct the city manager and to ask why we went and got tear gas on purpose to use in advance on that Sunday. How did that happen? I am under the impression because my heart is broken that this was coming. It was just caught. And I know there's a lot of concern about the water bottles, and I think that's egregious, and it, we're deserving of that kind of national attention. But we need to talk about the harm against Black, Brown, and Indigenous persons that happens every day that isn't recorded, the trauma that isn't seen, the people that aren't held accountable. Because right now, we're really having this bigger conversation because white people were hit in the face with projectiles. And so if we're gonna heal our entire community, then we're gonna need to see accountability. And that means taking responsibility, not council saying, I just want to make really sure that y'all know that we didn't say use tear gas. We all did. We passed budgets. We passed policies. We don't have written consent to search for anything but cars. So a car driving down the street has more constitutional protections than I do walking on the sidewalk. We can do better. We have to demand better. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Sage, you now have the floor. I too was very disappointed in how we handled the protest. And I have friends and coworkers that were injured and impacted. And I, I you know, embarrassed isn't even quite the right word. It's just unjust. Um, it made, it sent me spinning. How did we get here? How did the police force become this volatile? How are we as a community supporting this and perpetuating it? Are we training these officers? Is there a line item in our budget center for this? Are we storing tear gas? Are we buying it every year? Does it expire? What are we investing in these things that are so damaging to our And while I'm thankful that there was an initiative from the police chief to stop afterwards, I'm very disappointed it happened in the first place. I'm very disappointed have riot gear for these types of situations and that people were ready and armed and trained to handle it. It's, I learned so much from that experience and thank you to Matt who was out there filming it. And just the energy in the streets was somewhat terrifying and enlightening. We need radical change. I don't know what that looks like and I think it's going to take time and community input and trial and um, the words defund or improve law enforcement. And I just, oh, I'm reimagining public safety is what comes to mind and looking at how we are handling our community and caring for each other. When we are sending armed officers out to help people who are experiencing a mental crisis, it is not helpful. And we have people who specialize in mental health. When we are sending armed officers to meet houseless persons in our community undergoing a situation, that is not helping them either when we have homeless advocacy and specialists in our community. So there are some things that we can check off the list right away, but we really need a grander conversation in the state, in the region, in the nation, about how we are handling and caring for our community members. And I personally, I just know we can do better. Thank you, Sage. Uh, Keith, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Um, kudos to the comments from him. I appreciate that because uh, in this moment we have we have a lot of issues to deal with. Um, issues that affect all of our citizens. The death of George Floyd was pretty much the catalyst to this nation's largest civil rights movement, a movement that is supported by Black Americans, but also by white allies to the Black community, allies that I am thankful for and deeply appreciate. But nonetheless, this is a movement that largely describes the treatment of Blacks in America uh, for a sustained period of time. Um, you know, this is this is not just the city of Asheville issue. These are issues that other municipalities uh, and diverse communities around this country basically have to wrestle with on a daily basis through a larger context within American history and what has happened throughout it that brings us to this very point in time. Uh, we are basically at a precipice where action does need to occur. Now that we all understand that, Let's move forward with reimagining police and keep in consideration those who are greatly affected by policing in America on a daily basis, not just to protest, not to minimize anything, but to elevate and say, now that we all realize how serious the, the, the situation is with policing in America, how do we move that forward? How do we actually reimagine what policing looks like? Not only for me as a black man, but for those who experience any sort of adverse actions from the police that violate constitutional rights, such as the fourth, uh, illegal searches and seizures, all of those things. We have a lot of work to do, um, but the only way for us to move forward is to one, acknowledge, realize, and move forward together with the understanding that some of these issues affect a greater uh, part of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Sandra, the floor is yours. Yes, I too uh, was very uh, upset with what happened um, with the police department and the protesters. But like Keith and Cam and all of them were saying, this is something that um, basically it's, it's a reflection of the poor training in the police department. It's a re reflection uh, the basically uh, the status quo of what they've been doing all the time, what they've been getting away with. So it was not anything that, like you said, this is not an isolated incident or is in Asheville. This is happening all over and it always has. So what has happened with the George Floyd incident, it pretty much put a magnifying glass on things that are occurring. So now everybody is beginning to take notice. I tell people that we're in a, a period now of an awakening. An awakening period, what happens then, the best thing we can do is teach and educate and reform. And basically, that's what we need to do with the police department. I had a chance to speak with um, Chief Zach, and that was one of the questions that I asked him about was, you know, who gave that order? You know, who's responsible for these things happening? And he basically looked me in the eye and told me, he said, I am. He said, I gave the orders. He said, I'm not going to shy away from it. It's my responsibility. So, and I really appreciated him telling me that. And he went on too to share some other initiatives that they had put in place to actually move uh, uh, basically the, the police department. He also said that he was aware of the people coming in from the, the other policemen coming in from Hennessyville in the different areas. However, he made Expect it. He said he didn't expect those things to happen, but he is responsible because he allowed it. And I think that's the first thing we have to do. When people start being accountable for things they do, then we can make the changes that we need to make. And that's with everybody. Thank you all very much for your input on that. We'll move to question five. And this will be our last question. Lack of oversight appears to be a common theme through issues like equity, law enforcement, some of the other things we've discussed. How would you work towards improving that oversight in the city government? Um, we will start with Rich and I will give you the floor. All right, I get, I get to go first again. Um, so um, this is something that is um, actually, if you if you go look at my website right now, there's three pillars of, of what I want, why I want to run as a city council member. The third of those is that we need transparency and we need to rebuild trust in government. 
And what I say at the, in that section is that without a transparent government that's trusted by the people and it's reaching out and, and hearing everybody, none of the other stuff that we try to do is going to get very far. And I think that's what we're seeing when we see the city council um, react in belated and hap haphazard ways to crisis after crisis. And so um, transparency is my default mode. It is a, um, it, it's why I, I founded Asheville's biggest politics discussion group on Facebook. Um, it's why I'm um, a person that fields questions, you know, sometimes, you know, dozens a week from community members who are just looking for straight, incredible information on um, an issue that they're facing on their street or their block or their neighborhood. I think the what city council runs into, having watched all the city council members that are currently on council run their campaigns and having watched how they how they operate over the last five years, is that it's a big job and it's a job that takes well-intentioned amateurs and just gobbles them up and steamrolls them with the bureaucracy and spits them out. I think what I bring that makes me. Um, that makes me the person that you want in that role is that I've been on the side of the neighborhood and the streets and the community group advocating for a specific action against the city. I've been on the city commission and the committee and I've been in the meetings with staff and seen how they, how their thought process works. And I know how to take your idea or your question or the thing that you need, the storm water running through your, your driveway and turn that into a policy or an action that's going to meaningfully approve, improve your life. It's, it's not the step that's missing is more reports from department heads or more, you know, or, or, or more of the sort of actions that we've seen or more, more firings, more of the sort of actions that we've seen the council take. It's knowing how to take your question. This is happening. The trees are coming down in my neighborhood. We're, we're, we're experiencing health effects and how to turn that into a policy that makes it through all of the layers of staff and management and all of the different interests to come out with something that turns your life just a little bit better or a lot better. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, Sage, you have the floor now. This is a great question. Um, bravo. So I, I appreciate it because I love questions. So this answer is interesting, but I think questions matter. I ask a lot of questions. I'm on a lot of boards and committees and chair a lot of things, and I ask a lot of questions. So if you've engaged with me in uh, any kind of leadership capacity, you're probably aware that I have a lot of questions. And I think this is something that seems to be lacking, and I don't know if it's just the pace at which we go through um, council meetings or what, but often I'm left with so many more questions despite the issue having gone through the process already. So I think we need to improve this. And one of the tools that has helped actually has been a byproduct of COVID, which is this idea that we're now having all of our meetings virtually and shared. So this was something that like Sunshine Request has been working on and providing a service that we had been trying to get done in all these meetings and is now suddenly available. It's going to increase participation and access to be able to help educate the community on various issues. Um, you know, accountability is, is hard. When I first started running for office, they sent us a, um, an email and said, hey, you know, if you have a question, you reach out to the uh, city manager's assistant and we'll respond with the answer to all of the candidates. And I thought, okay, well, can you send me the whole budget? Because I assumed that what we were seeing, that there had to be so much more. Like this four page budget that amendment that just recently passed. I do budgeting for a living and I thought it was bizarre. Certainly there would be more information. So we have to get really honed in on what we're allowing our community to partake in and all of the information, all of the transparency, all the ac access that needs to happen to make sure that the community members are fully informed and have the opportunity to ask the questions and the space to do so when it comes up. I also think that Asheville is. Uh, quite remarkable in a lot of ways, but one of which is that we are trying to be everything all the time. And we want to lead on every issue, and we want to address every issue, and sometimes I'm worried that we are overwhelming ourselves. And just like the rest of us individual lives and businesses, you can't do everything all the time and do it well. So if we are trying to focus and trying to hone in on access and accountability, then it should be one of our five top things. 
and not have 30 top things, which sometimes it seems like we do. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think I'll stop. Okay, thank you, Sage. Uh, Keith, you are, you have the floor. Let's see, a lack of oversight appears to be a common theme through issues like equity, law enforcement, et cetera. How would you work toward improving that oversight in city government? I think the way to improve oversight in the city government is to have a council and members on council that are willing to ask the questions, that are willing to say, we need some answers, um, willing to push the envelope and not just accept um, you know, what's coming to us from staff. I think Rich made a good point, which I would I would agree with, which is you know, bu bureaucracy does tend to uh, take good-minded, well-hearted uh, individuals and chew them up and spit them out in a way that you, you can't possibly imagine. And there is a, uh, there has to be an ability for individuals that come on council to be able to say, we're going to ask the questions that sometimes folks don't want us to ask. We're going to ask them not only behind the scenes, but we're going to ask them in public as well. And we're going to hold everybody accountable. Um, to, 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 for that oversight, uh, transparency and, and everything else. Um, that's what people uh, look for when they can't be there. You know, everybody that goes out and votes for you can't be in that meeting that it's not public. Everybody that goes out and votes for you uh, can't grab the mic from you on the dais and say, ask these questions. They can only look to you and hope that you are willing to ask some of the things that make you uncomfortable and to figure out a way collectively as a group, how do we move forward and make this right for our citizens? And it's, you know, working together, asking the tough questions and being part of the team to uh, work collectively for the citizens of Asheville. And I think, you know, that's exactly right. So kudos, Rich, for, for saying that. Um, that's exactly where we need to be. All right, thank you, sir. Kim, you have the floor. Well, I feel like we can uh, look forward to doing a lot of improvement in this area. So I think um, this is a time to get excited because um, first of all, I've been running on participatory budgeting and democracy um, for this whole year and the last time that I ran in 2017. I've been at every city council meeting but three since December 9th, 2014. And I've reported back to the community. I attend 12 to 15 hours of board and commission meetings a month. Um, and I was doing that because I knew that so many of my friends and neighbors couldn't be in the room when important decisions were being made about them without them. So if we're going to center the people and the planet instead of the profit of developers and the hotel industry, we are going to have to actually value what the people's input is. And I don't see that happening right now. I have seen public comment cut down. I've seen it made fun of at times. Um, it's been really discouraging, but there's been windows of celebration too. Um, because so many of us in the community were showing up, videoing meetings, reporting back to community, City Hall started taping six of the council subcommittees. And all of a sudden those meetings were more accessible because people could watch from home, they could watch later on their own time and not wait a whole entire month for those minutes to come out. And I think what we've seen through this pandemic is that making it possible for, for people to participate from home or from wherever they are um, increases accessibility and removes a barrier to participation. So I think that's one of the things that we do need to take forward. It's one of the things that we've been considering for a long time when we think about the barriers to participation. But I also want us to think about like who's being excluded and why. With participatory budgeting, People get to make real decisions on the, the spending, it's like anything you can build um, in your neighborhood and your community. Greensboro, North Carolina is doing it. Durham's already doing it. If you need a sidewalk, the community comes together. Whatever gets the most votes in a community starting at age 14 so our youth can join us in this process and start engaging in the democratic process and decision making and um, take credit and ownership of those um, the work that's being done, um, then that is getting done. And the infrastructure that's getting done in Greensboro and Durham are a lot of the things that I see that our community needs. So it's a way to show that people's voice matters and it's a way for us to practice centering the voice of the people and showing up and really valuing it at the same time. 
As far as what it could mean for overall oversight, this really does come back to having people who are committed to being faithful in the work and diligent to make sure that the people's voice is elevated, that we demand healing as our focus, equity as our demand, and resiliency as our goal for our shared success. Thank you, Kim. Um, Sandra, the floor is now yours. Yes, I, I agree that the lack of oversight uh, appears to be, you know, the main topic of all the issues that we're dealing with now. Uh, and, and basically what happens with that is I think that there are oversight uh, committees in place. It's been, uh, plenty of oversight committees. It's just that they're not doing their job. You know, what happens, I think that basically with the bureaucracy, how people work, uh, sort of you take care of me, I take care of you, that type of thing is very prevalent uh, in, um, in the city. I've seen it. And I've also seen as far as situations is to put the squeaky wheel. As I said, Apple's got a lot of issues. And I found out that the squeaky wheels are the ones that get the oil. Not the one that's most uh, needed or necessary is the squeaky, the ones that get the loudest voice. And I think what we need to do is start sit back and look and start simplifying issues, simplifying basically like a, a forest budget issues and things like that. So the people can actually understand what is going on. And then if you simplify it, and then you try to prioritize different things that are important. Like Kim was saying about letting people vote on what they think or, or feel like uh, is more important to get done. I think we could definitely see some change. What I was basically concerned with is we do a lot of talking in the city. I have never heard any, I've never heard so many discussions and surveys and da 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 da, but no action. Uh, and that's the reason my campaign was based on solutions, act, uh, <laughs> solutions plus actions with the results. And the reason I said that is because people need to see to see the results. People need to see and feel the changes. Otherwise, it's all useless. And that's what I'm basically about. I think that my campaign, what I would do is make sure I get out there and find out what the needs are that the people want and make sure that they can see those changes and they can feel those changes. And I think that's what's needed. And one thing about me is this, I tell people, I have been on every side of the, uh, the road of pretty much everybody. I, have, I know what it's like to have nothing. I know what it's like to have everything I want. And I know what it's like to lose it all. And I know what it's like to build it back. And that's what I'm doing now. And that's what I would bring to the city, knowledge and experience. And I could pull on those, go on, on those experiences to do things that the community need. And that's why I'm running for city council, because I think that I definitely can bridge the gap of communication that the city so, uh, so much deserves. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time and thought and those questions. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to move into the closing statements. Um, everybody will get three minutes. Um, we're going to start with Sage. So I will give you the floor. Again, you guys have three minutes to make your closing statements, and I will step away. Thank you, Matt. So again, for those of you who are listening on the radio, barely tuned into video, I am Sage Turner and have lived in Asheville for 20 years. You've heard us talk a lot about some important issues in the community tonight, and I just want to express that I'm committed to this community. I have raised my family here and have no intention of leaving Asheville. I'm committed to our community processes. I'm committed to my neighbors. I'm committed to the, the ongoing situations that tend to creep up, but also the long-term solutions that we need to make this city the sustainable and environmental, fiscal, and socially responsible and sustainable community that we all seem to so desire but can't seem quite how to figure out. Um, I don't think it's easy to share a lot of information about these various positions in a two-minute um, answer, so I want to encourage everyone to go to my website, which is stageforashville.com, and I put a lot of time and effort into this because of the pandemic and the limited way that we've been able to meet and uh, discuss things with each other. So. There's a lot of information on positions, there's a lot of videos, there's, I'll be sharing this kind of forum if you um, weren't able to see it tonight. There are endorsements and testimonials, there's COVID resources, there's a lot of information. And I think, you know, with the current situation and it being this close to voting, uh, I encourage everyone to go and do their research. Uh, we've all answered a dozen or so questionnaires. I've posted all of mine on there and I would appreciate um, people taking the time to look at that. 
There's also an ask and answer portion where you can reach me directly. You can also email me at sageforashville at gmail.com and I will do my best to get back to you. Um, I think we have a lot of hard work to do in Asheville and it's not necessarily going to be easy work, but I'm a very hard worker and I am committed to this community and to doing the best that I can to help us get through the various issues and I need your support. So we have about nine days until early voting. Early voting kicks off on the 15th and runs through the 31st and voting day is November 3rd. So it's crunch time and I would like your support. I need your vote. I would like for you to consider volunteering and contributing to all, not just me, but all the candidates that you support here tonight. And I appreciate your time. I appreciate WPVM for making time for this forum and for hosting it virtually and uh, Matt for your uh, moderation. And thank you. And thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Keith, we will step on you and I will give you the floor. Um, if you weren't here in 2015 to vote for me and you're wondering who Keith Byrne is, I'm a deputy clerk of Superior Court. Uh, I'm the kid who was brought home as a baby to live in public housing, whose grandparents were the first in the city to live in public housing, but I'm also an individual who believes in opportunity. And our country right now is at a critical point in this day and time. We are dealing with so many issues from who sits in the White House to who's sitting with their knee on my neck as a black man in America. And through social economic catastrophe and a pandemic, it seems as though things just won't let up. And as we get closer to election day, it seems as though we all face issues that are insurmountable. However, they are not. And in every race for every office around this country, we are all fighting for what Joe Biden says is the soul of our nation and the communities that we all call home. It is imperative that we elect individuals who stand for what's right, individuals who are willing to speak truth, individuals who are willing to listen, and individuals who are willing to show leadership. We are at a moment where we need each other. We need our communities to be strong, all of our communities the ones that organize and the ones that don't, because this election isn't about who has the best plan on paper, it's about who has the courage to bring us all together and the ability to bridge the gap between bureaucracy and the many communities that we are supposed to serve so that we can all thrive together, so that we can live together, so that we can grow together. Asheville is going through a tremendous period of not only dealing with all of our social economic issues, um, but economics as well. And we need, we need small businesses. We need them to thrive. We need our buses to run. We need our people paid. We need our police. And we all need to be a community of one. We need each other and we need to move Asheville forward together with everybody around the table. I'm already leaning into all of our critical issues and approaching them with what I hope anybody who comes on council would approach them with, and that's empathy, compassion, poise, and a duty to serve our entire community. I've been on the job, I've been doing the work, I've been able to bring a much needed perspective to the table in this city that hasn't been voiced in the way it has in the past. And that perspective is important. And it's helped change the trajectory of this city in a really meaningful way. I want to continue to amplify your voices and your concerns and work for the improvement of all of our communities, our collective community, which is Asheville. And so I hope you'll give me your vote and allow me to continue to do the work and to continue to amplify your voice so that we can all move Asheville forward together. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Keith. Uh, next, we have Kim. I will give you the floor. So once again, my name is Kim Roney. I'm a piano teacher, service industry worker, community radio producer, and friend and neighbor. I rely on public transit. I walk and I ride my bike. So I know that we need improvement of infrastructure. Um, before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I had the opportunity while canvassing to knock on the door of the house where my great grandmother lived in Kenilworth. 
she was nine years old when women got the right to vote, but not yet everyone had the right to vote. Um, I spoke with my great great aunt Faye about what it meant to live here in Asheville um, during the Great Depression. Um, and right around the corner from where they lived, one of my piano students lives now. And so I hear my students talking about how Asheville has no love for them, but they're going to have to leave when they get old enough um, because there's no affordable housing. Their parents are struggling to make it here. Um, there's not jobs that pay well. So one of the reasons I'm running is I see that we have an opportunity, a choice to make together because we're woven together and we need each other. Are we going to maintain the status quo? I don't think we should. It was hurting each other. It wasn't working. Um, and it is not about getting in the right relationship with the planet. Or are we going to be about it being better? And that means that I'm committed to the work for climate justice, for reimagining public safety, which for me means standing in solidarity with the Black ABL demands and intergenerational leadership calling to divest from 50% of the police budget so that we can invest in long-term safety strategies like what keeps us safe, housing, um, mental health care, uh, economic mobility, um, being able to access work and groceries, um, community gardens, and being prepared for a resilient community in the face of climate change. I'm committed to a fare free regional transportation network that includes safer roads and more mobility that's accessible. I'm committed to participatory budgeting that ensures equity and the people's voice at the table during our budget and planning and policy decisions. I'm committed to deeply affordable housing through creative and cooperative solutions and addressing our opportunity gap in our schools. I can't do this work alone. I need our entire community to come together to hold me accountable to this work and to join me in the work. You can get more information, including all the issues that I just addressed that I know that our community needs we need to do together by visiting my website, which is timroney4ashville.com. That's the number four, so timroney4ashville.com. And I wanna invite us to remember that during this year where we're dealing with so much at a national and state level, that these local issues are going to be handled by the people that are on the back of your ballot. So when you show up to vote early, October 15th through the 31st, please don't forget to make sure you turn over and do both pages of your ballot. Look for the people that you can hold accountable at the grocery store and on the sidewalk so that we can do this work together. I'm endorsed by Councilwoman Shanika Smith, Councilman Brian Haynes, Reverend Amy Cantrell, um, and many neighbors like yourself the Sierra Club, the Sunrise Movement North Carolina and Sunrise Asheville and Quality and Truth, the Buncombe County and Asheville Association of Educators, our firefighters, the Center for Biological Diversity and people like you. So thank you so much for the opportunity to join here at this forum today and at my old stomping grounds, WPVM. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Sandra, you now have the floor. Okay. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity here this evening. And I would like to ask for your vote. And the one thing that I think that we really need to start working on is I think people need to start communicating. Uh, and when I say communicating, I mean, what happens with people is this, when people are afraid of change and what we're going through right now is the biggest change uh, uh, pretty much in not only the country, but in the world that I've seen in my lifetime. And this particular change, and one thing about change, change brings fear. And, and, and the reason I bring this up is because we can talk about these issues all day long, but unless people actually understand what is going on and the impact and how it affects people, all people, then it's almost uh, in vain. And the reason I say that, the Black Lives Matter movement was growing something like 68% as far as a, a popular, uh, pop, popular vote. People love it. As of now, it's dropped down to the 2%. And, I mean, low, lower 50%. And what happens with that is because people are fearful. They're fearful of change. So I would like for us to take this opportunity, all of us, to educate each other to start having those difficult conversations with your neighbors, your friends, your, your, your teachers, even your children. We've got to start having those conversations where we feel comfortable. People wonder about what's going on with the police department. If you notice, a lot of the policemen that do these things that we look at, how could they do, do that? They're doing it out of fear. Let's be real, it's fear. 
And so until we start changing the complexion of what really is going on uh, with the race uh, and the racial injustice and the systematic racism, until we start really understanding, we can talk about those terms and use those terms all the time. But until the people start understanding the effect. And the one thing about me, I will say, I know what it's like to be falsely accused uh, I've arrested and uh, uh, arm twisted behind my back and handcuffed in front of my peers in a crew room as a flight attendant. I know what that feels like. That happened to me. And you know what my crime was? My crime was past due parking tickets that were never even due. Now, and this is, and the reason I tell you these things, we need to start sharing our experiences so people can understand. It's not us just beating a drum and talking about racial injustice and all these different things. The, pretty much everyone I'm talking to, people that I talk to, they've experienced these same uh, issues that I have and many more. So I think that the main thing we need to do in the city, in the community is start uniting, coming together, having those difficult conversations. Once we have those difficult conversations, then we can start moving toward solutions because people will begin to understand. So I tell people all the time, we are in the awakening period and from the awakening period, we will move on to the Renaissance, which is the rebirth of a new community together. Thank you, Sandra. Rich, you now have the floor, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry for having to step away. Um, somebody just broke in the front window of my office and um, was trying to come in. So, um, oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm going to have to cut this short. No uh, worries. You know, my, I, l I look at this field and the, the field of, of people that ran in the primary. And, you know, obviously we've got, we're drawing more and more um, talented and qualified people to each one of these elections. And so um, when I made the decision to run for city council again, I really spent a long time thinking about what, what do I offer that the city needs right now? And I found after I thought about it for a long time that my answer really wasn't that different from what it was when I made the decision the first time um, 15 years ago. No, I'm sorry, five years ago. Um, the city is changing. The, the qualities that we've known and loved um, over you know, however long we've been here are, are changing, and I'm, I'm not sure that they persist through the next decade. The city that supported me as a, a teenager and a guy in my 20s working in retail, but, but living a life that I enjoyed with my, you know, and, and participating in arts and culture and the vibrancy of the community is, is changing. The people that are arriving here or coming out of school in their, seven, in their teens or their 20s now aren't having the opportunities that we have. And without intentional and quick action, uh, without deliberate haste is the, the, the phrase that I keep using, uh, without um, intelligence and passion, love and smarts, I, I, I'm really not sure how we, we manage that. And we're used to hearing that elections are critical times, but I'm, I, I'm really not sure without the people in place who have both the experience and the passion and know and and can lead the community that can bring the leadership to to take the community through these crises some of which are unexpected but some of which are have been have been visible and festering for with all due respect to the current city council through all the terms of city council that I have followed since I first became aware of local politics. In my business, we say that we don't know what the crisis is going to be, but we know that there's going to be a crisis. And we're, we're seeing that happen now. The, the brakes that have been off the vehicle as far as the explosion of the tourism economy in Asheville are finally, we're finally start, we're, we're starting to notice them as we get into the hairpin turns. And that's something that that just has to be addressed now. I look at um, my kids, you know, and they're my, um, they're, they're my goal and my moral guidance for all of this. And they wanna be inventors and computer programmers and, and archeologists and pet trainers. And I, I don't know how to tell them that those careers don't exist in a way that will support them here in Asheville except to tell them that they don't exist yet, but we're gonna get there. And 
I ended my um, I ended my first speech I ever made as a city council member with a, a phrase that 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 sticks with me, and that's that we we at the end of the day, all of this, everything that we've proposed here comes down to to a spreadsheet and a vote. We need somebody who is familiar with the finances and somebody who can make a plan. And so how, why not a person who does that for a living? Anyways, uh, thank you again for everybody for, for putting on this forum. And thank you for everybody who's watching and engaging. Thank you to the thousands and thousands of Asheville residents who've already voted. Please go get your vote out as, as soon as possible. And, um, and I look forward to having your support and reach out to me if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Rich. Well, that will conclude tonight's Asheville City Council debate um, hosted here at 103.7 WPBM. Uh, with that, we're going to sign off. We have a short video we're going to play before the end. Again, we appreciate everybody joining us via radio and live stream. And thank you again, City Council-elect, for uh, joining us tonight. Um, we wish you all the best, and we will start that video now. Thanks for our uh, coordinator behind the scenes listening to WPVM's Asheville City Council Candidate Forum. WPVM is a listener-supported community station. We are required to be non-commercial. Instead, we're supported by donations and underwriters. We bring to the listener timely forums like tonight, local and national news, stories of community business and nonprofits, and hours of local and regional music. To do this, we need financial support, so please make a donation to support the station by going to WPVMFM.org and click the Donate button.